Last rankings show of the week. This time, quarterbacks and tight ends, the onesie positions. Ray GQ is back with me. Ray, some awesome, awesome matchups this week. Can't wait to see the obvious if that works out or if some players bounce back and we kick things off with your rankings with Lamar Jackson at the Cincinnati Bengals. Two point favorites here on the road. And we also are going to pull up at the exact same time. Joe Burrow, who's your quarterback six this week. Yeah, really, really excited about this matchup. If you guys cannot tell or could not have to uh, told from the past two shows with running backs and wide receivers, this is a matchup where I believe Lamar Jackson, QB1 on the week, his ability to do damage on the ground and the efficiency that he's shown through the air early this season versus a Cincinnati defense that you can throw the ball on. I think this is going to be an opportunity where Lamar and both Derrick Henry on the ground with their legs. Lamar Jackson right now currently third in points per game, scoring for the quarterback position right behind Jaden Daniels and right behind yeah. one of our favorites, Jordan Love. But in this matchup versus Burrow, how susceptible Cincinnati is on the ground, I think this is a, a smash spot for Baltimore. Lamar Jackson with his legs and the arm. We thought this Bengals rush defense would be worrisome heading into the season. To me, it's even worse than expected. And... It's amazing that Lamar Jackson won the MVP award last year with about 800 rushing yards and five touchdowns on the year. I know it's a lost cause or maybe just point blank stupid to do on pace for stats after four games, but Lamar Jackson is on his way for 174 carries, 1300 yards and eight rushing scores, uh, which would be very different again than the MVP season that we got last year. But it makes sense that this is one of those games that it's going to be a lot of Lamar, a lot of Derrick Henry. And honestly, Ray, when you watch the games, it's a bit more different than like the Greg, Greg Roman rushing seasons that we got with him, where that was a bunch of pistol, that was a bunch of shotgun. Now it's a bunch of under center downhill runs. And we also get some boot action and scrambles off of that too. Yeah, it looks a lot different with Lamar this year. It's a deliberate downhill. It's kind of like a smash mouth attack with Lamar Jackson. And Cincinnati, again, they're giving up the 11th most points uh, per game to opposing quarterbacks. And right ahead of them, the Baltimore Ravens are giving up the 10th most points to opposing quarterbacks. So as good as a spot as I believe this is for Lamar Jackson, I equally believe this is a really good spot for Joe Burrow to get some things going through the air, his connection with Jamar Chase as well. Well, let's talk about that because we're going to try something a bit different here on this show. Instead of talking about one side of the matchup and then waiting, I don't know, six players to talk about the other side of the matchup, I'm just going to throw both the quarterbacks up there so we can talk about the entire game in general. And then I'll move some quarterbacks around to get it in the right ranking order, which you all can, you know, click the end of the video if you want the full list and how it's appropriate and how it's supposed to be. But let's talk about Joe Burrow on the opposite end of that. I mean, this is the man who has thrown multiple touchdown passes in each of the past three games. Uh, we know the Ravens have been solid in defense the last two weeks, just allowing a league low 55% completion rate to Dak Prescott and Josh Allen. Uh, Burrow, though, again, these last two weeks, he got T. Higgins back. And to me, when T. Higgins is on the field, that just makes things, simply put, easier for someone like Jamar Chase. Yeah, it's it's a different it's a different offense with T. Higgins on the field. And as challenging as Baltimore's defense has been, like you alluded to, for uh, Dak Prescott a few weeks ago, when teams are facing Baltimore, they are still throwing the ball more than expected, over 5.5%, number one in the NFL. And when you look at what Cincinnati likes to do, their pass rate over expected top four in the NFL, only behind Minnesota, Seattle, and Cleveland. So again, this is a matchup where all stars should align. Joe Burrow having his full complement of weapons, them not being able to potentially run the ball on the ground versus this defense, and what the Ravens should be able to do should yield for some high-scoring opportunities. This is why we like Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. I'm a little bit nervous because right now in the pick -em lobby, the higher or lower on his just pass attempts is at 35 and a half. I'm a little nervous because of how successful this Ravens offense is going to be if they're just not going to get that many possessions. Like, we could look back and the – the Bengals have like legit seven drives this entire game, seven series this entire game. And if that's the case, uh, then it's going yeah. to be, have to be highly efficient, highly efficient ball. Um, before we move on this morning, because he is a wide receiver and a star wide receiver at that Devonte Adams elected to post on his social media, maybe a hint of where he was going. Uh, it was a picture of Edgar Allan Poe. Now we don't know if he's just very into poetry today or if this is a suggestion, Ray, that Devontae Adams 
could be headed in the direction of the Baltimore Ravens. We don't have to spend five minutes on this, but just your quick thoughts on someone of the talent of the caliber like Devontae Adams potentially joining a team like the Baltimore Ravens and Lamar Jackson. I kid you not. This has been my secret fit for him all summer. I love Zay Flowers, and it is not an indictment on Zay Flowers, the player. I think is an incredible player. But they need somebody who can desperately win one-on-one -on -one versus man coverage, get down the field, and be a primary target for Lamar on the outside. If this were to come to fruition, I actually think this would be a great thing for the entire offense. Zay Flowers, whichever tight end is your preference, Lamar and the rushing game, this is a fit that it makes a lot of sense. Would the Raiders actually trade him to a, a conference rival? I, I'm not sure about that, but I think this would be a really good fantasy and NFL fit for Lamar and the Ravens. Yeah, I love it first from a fun football standpoint. I mean, think of, and we can kind of still consider this the offseason, the offseason-ish, right? Adding mm -hmm. someone like Derrick Henry and then adding someone like Devontae Adams to a team that was already solid with an MVP winning quarterback last year, it takes like solid to elite in both of those positions. You know, the Gus Edwards, J.K. Dobbins up to Derrick Henry, the Zay Flowers, Rashad Bateman up to Devontae Adams. And if you go back and look at the first two weeks when this team was kind of forced or elected to throw the football a bit more often, I felt like on third downs, for example, they didn't have that one true man-to-man -man ball winner, go up and get it, gotta have it type. Devontae Adams would obviously be that. The third downs success in those games kind of dictated that. They were 10 of 25 in the first two games combined on third down. So we know like against this team, what they did last week, um, they're going to really be able to run the football on their opponents. But if that doesn't work, then having someone to the effect of Devontae Adams to win in isolation would kind of give them all the answers to whenever the defense asks them questions, if that makes sense. And do you think, Josh, is there going to be something happen? If you had to predict, does Adams get moved this season before the trade land? Now, we don't see a lot of big name moves happen right. in the NFL. Do you think this is one that feels destined to happen? It, it does to me. I, I think he's at the point and where the Raiders are at this point. And in fact, things that just came out about Antonio Pierce during his time at Arizona State uh, and how it certainly seems like with the Raiders, he... Part of the reason he got the job was because he had the backing of the locker room. And that is even starting to wane a little bit if you kind of read between the lines of what's being reported out there. So I, I think that Raiders team might be hitting the reset button right now and pushing him to a contender. And if it can't be, you know, the Jets and Aaron Rodgers or the Saints and Derek Carr, then this, again, is like maybe the missing puzzle piece for the Ravens for them to, we already know they're a fantastic regular season team, but to be like one of the final four teams out there in the AFC. Agreed. Agreed. By the way, I will do my best to build a pick'em entry out there with these quarterbacks and these tight ends as we go along. That means you all need to be playing it on Underdog. Just click the link in the description down below or enter promo code THE SHOW and we'll throw a whole bunch of free stuff at you. It's Boosttober. If you don't know that, new boosts every single day. I think today it's like four different NB WNBA picks you can have. So go and play on Underdog and Best Ball Resurrection while you are there. All right, let's move things on over to your quarterback two. Man, oh man, this is Jaden Daniels. This is Jaden Daniels. D5. At, excuse me, at home against the Cleveland Browns. Three and a half point leads, uh, favorites here, I should say. I said leads because he's the leading rusher among all rookies in the NFL at this point, And he plays the quarterback position. How do you feel like, because on paper, this is going to be at least the best defense he's matching up against all season long. Absolutely. And I'm excited to see him take on this challenge. This is going to be a challenge right now. You look at the Browns defense and again, not the defense that we're accustomed to of the past, but they're still very formidable against the quarterback position, giving up uh, the 26th most difficult opponent uh, defense uh, uh, to opposing quarterbacks, only allowing 12.3 points per game to opposing quarterbacks. One of the things that I love about Jaden Daniels, besides the fact that he's been wildly accurate, very lethal with his throwing, is when things do break down and there is pressure around him, he scrambles at a very high clip, giving oh, us yeah. some more opportunities. 38% of the time when he's under pressure on his dropbacks, he is scrambling, which is almost double the next closest the next closest player, which is Lamar Jackson at 21% of the time when he's under pressure. They're scrambling. And what happens when you get 
a defense or two offenses that want to play fast. The Cleveland Browns are passing at a rate in which nobody expects them to do that, especially with Deshaun Watson. And you got the commanders who are who are running no huddle over 50 percent of the time, trying to keep defenses confused off guard. This could truly be the launching point for Jaden Daniels ranked as a top two, top three quarterback for the remainder of the season. He's already scoring at an elite clip. If he goes out there and does what he should do versus this defense, it's going to be hard to keep him outside the top three week to week, no, ma no matter what the matchup is. I think that's a great point. It's this week against the Browns, next week against the Ravens. If he achieves those and accomplishes those, then he's a locked in top four quarterback with the guys like Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, even Jalen Hurts the rest of the way, right? Um, now, specifically about this game, I think we're copying off the same notes for the test here because I had the exact same thoughts where, you know, the Browns are sixth in pressure rate, third best rate of man coverage in the league. They blitz at the fourth highest rate in the league, and that's just going to equal scrambles. Now, I do wonder on like these RPO concepts if Jim Schwartz is going to say, well, I'd actually rather you throw it than run it. And that could lead us in the direction here in the pick and lobby of 19 and a half completions, because that's very low for how precise and everything Jane Daniels is being right now. But I still want to lean on this 49 and a half rushing yards higher. That is a lot. That is a lot. But just the combination, like you said, of right now, and this isn't a negative because he's just faster than everyone else across the field right now. He takes off when he's pressured or he takes off when he has extra time. And the way he's already able to get up to like 19 or 20 miles per hour at the line of scrimmage to work around these defensive linemen is something else. So uh, how do you feel about this 49 and a half higher? I like it. And the fact that Brian Robinson is still iffy on if he's going to play now, apparently one hour ago, he tweeted out a picture with a thumbs up. I, I don't know if that's mm. thumbs up. It's a good Friday or I'm good to go, but it's still unclear if he's going to play. Jaden Daniels is going to scramble, and even if Miles Garrett doesn't play, there will be pressure. Even though this is a high yardage mark, this is this is time for him to shine. I don't mind this at all. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. By the way, if you want to go and attend this Cleveland Browns Washington Commanders game, you can get in the door and let's say section one thirty one, row eighteen, for eighty three dollars a piece. You can sit eighteen rows up right now, just for eighty three dollars. And you can do that by going to SeatGeek and use our code FANTASY10 and get 10% off any ticket. And I mean any ticket, whether you're a new customer or not, that equals sports, that equals concerts, that equals festivals, you name it, especially 83 bucks right now to go watch Jaden Daniels torch Jim Schwartz's defense. <laughs> Again, code FANTASY10 for 10% off any ticket, new or old customer. And that is on SeatGeek. Download the app and go and purchase your tickets today. All right, let's keep it moving. Uh, on the opposite end of this, I believe you have yeah. Deshaun Watson as quarterback 16. I feel like I say this every single week. It's put up or shut up time for Deshaun Watson. It has to happen this week. And Ray, I am terrified that it's not going to happen for him in this offense. I get it. I understand the hesitation. You're nervous. We do have buys. We just have to repeat that again, right, Josh? It's the third <laughs> show. There are there are no Jalen Hurts, no Jared yes. Goff. Yes. We've got some guys on buy. This matchup on paper should be a good one. I do believe the commander's defense has played better the past two weeks, but on paper, they're allowing the 12th most points to opposing quarterbacks. I am bullish on Amari Cooper. I am bullish on Jerry Judy. The fact that David Njoku is still very iffy on whether he's going to play. We're not going to get Nick Chubb this week. Something has to happen. Now, the commanders also could just go out there and put foot in Cleveland and no points are scored on the other side. But if we believe that Jaden Daniels is going to rush for 50 yards, complete over 20, 20 pass attempts, get the ball to Terry McLaurin, there's going to be rushing opportunities. Deshaun Watson, <laughs> you can exploit this defense. Please make it happen for us this week. That is really where I'm at with this one. Watson, put up or shut up. Call me crazy. I don't think it happens. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot when I was writing out my notes and building these tiers. I mean, Washington has punted the ball on 11.8% of their drives. That's the lowest rate in the league. Cleveland, on the other hand, has punted the ball on 50% of their drives. That's 31st in the league. They actually have the best red zone touchdown success rate in the league at about 85%. But Ray, it's because they never get in the end zone. 
they never get in the red zone. They get there the lowest, the fewest amount of times than any other team in the league. And I feel like, yeah, the tackles have been injured for this Cleveland Browns offense, but also the interior guard play with Wyatt Teller potentially missing. Um, that is where this Washington Commanders team with Jonathan Allen, with Deron Payne, with Johnny Newton on top of it now. Yep. I think that could cause them a whole bunch of havoc. And Deshaun Watson, it's not like they've had overly difficult matchups, and he has yet to pass for 200 yards in a single game this year. So again, I think we might look back on the Washington Commanders and say, oh, of course, their defense was so horrific in the first two, three, four weeks of the season. But we also see that they get better. And look, it can happen on paper. Like you said, it should happen. Uh, I'm just a little nervous that maybe the Browns offense is even more broken than the Commanders defense. And, and just to just to highlight that point, Cleveland is tied for or second in the NFL on just neutral dropbacks, sacks. Like Deshaun Watson just taking sacks left and right. It's down there with New England Patriots, the Tennessee Titans, and the Chicago Bears. So yep. I get it. I get it. <laughs> okay. Josh Allen is your quarterback three. This is at the Houston Texans. They are actually one-point favorites on the road. Uh, Texans defense has opened up against Anthony Richardson. We all know what happened in week one. Those Bombs were launched down the field. Uh, that's not how Josh Allen, this team is playing football right now. Right. Then they open against Caleb Williams and then Trevor Lawrence. So it hasn't been like a murderer's row in terms of awesome, precise, efficient quarterbacks so far this year. But the Texans have still allowed multiple touchdown passes in each of those three games. So I'm excited to see what someone like Josh Allen can do to this defense. Even though, Ray, I think that this D'Amico Ryan's led operation has some of the best young core pieces on that side of the football. Absolutely. And I, I, I do like what they're building in that secondary with Stingley and Jalen Petrie. You've got two bookend edge rushers and Will Anderson and Daniil Hunter. And despite the fact that, uh, you know, they, they haven't faced anything good really at the quarterback position from a consistency, pushing the ball downfield standpoint, they're, they're still allowing the six most points to opposing quarterbacks. Now, Josh Allen is not going to have number one target, Khalil Shakir. It looks like he's already been ruled out for week five. So now we're kind of relying on Keon Coleman, Curtis Samuel, Dalton Kincaid, which we'll talk yeah. about. I think this is going to be a matchup where he's going to have to put on his Superman cape, put that MVP jacket on, go get it versus Houston. You guys are favored without Khalil Shakir, probably a lot of ground and pound Allen as well. I might just be building an entire pick them entry with quarterback rushing yards. Uh, why not? We're getting more quarterback rushing yards now than we ever have before. Uh, and here's the note from the great Rich Rebar. Houston is 23rd in rushing points allowed to the quarterback position early in the season. And they're allowing 56 yards and a touchdown rushing to Andy Richardson and then 44 yards to Caleb Williams. And all the higher lower right now is 31 and a half rushing yards to Josh Allen. So we're going to plug that one in too. Uh, okay. On the opposite end of this and very close to Josh Allen is CJ Stroud as your quarterback seven. Talk to me. CJ Stroud, you know, we continue to talk about these defenses and as data starts to really start to normalize and we get some more weeks in there and the opponents that have been played, Buffalo's defense through the air right now looks really strong. Like you yep. can't score any points against this defense. And I know the start for year two CJ Stroud hasn't been as uh, rocket launch feeling as it was last year, but I still don't believe they faced a quarterback with the complement of weapons that the Houston Texans have. Now they're going to have to do this without Joe Mixon, which I actually think helps CJ Stroud's case to be ranked maybe even a little bit higher. You're getting Tank Dell back. We know what Nico Collins is going to do on the outside. Stefan Diggs. Uh, this is one where they're going to be points scored. And if we think Josh Allen is going to do his thing, CJ Stroud airing it out with Bobby Slowick at home. I have a lot of confidence in Houston. Josh, I am not as nervous about Buffalo's defense in this mm. matchup for CJ Stroud or these pass catchers. I don't think it's been a CJ Stroud issue. I think he's still playing fantastic football and kind of elevating his supporting cast when, you know, they've had 120 penalty yards on first and second downs. I'm looking at you, Larry Maytunzel, that should not be happening like three penalties a game that you're averaging now. Uh, that's very unlike what happened for him last year when, in many cases, despite the offensive line being injured, it was still, to me, one of the better pass blocking units across the league. Uh, Nate Tice, now of Yahoo Sports, had some awesome stats. Uh, quote, since week one, the Texans offense has had 46 snaps 
on third and fourth down, uh, they have thrown the ball on every single one of those plays. 46 plays, 46 dropbacks. And part of that is because the Texans have faced the longest average distance to go on third down since week one. I mean, week one was now a mirage compared to the rest of the season at 10.1 yards. So Ray, on average, they are losing yardage on first and second down to get to third down at this point. So yeah, I think the weakness of the Houston Texans matches up with the weakness of the Buffalo Bills defense, where it's the rushing game for the yep. Texans offense and the rushing game for the defense. And to me, what that makes is just an awesome matchup of CJ Stroud versus the Sean McDermott led operation and Sean McDermott led secondary. Sometimes football doesn't have to be difficult. It does not have to be complicated. <laughs> All right. Speaking of, uh, do you like missiles? Do you like people taking long bombs down the field? Well, that is Jordan Love here as the quarterback four. This is at the Los Angeles Rams. This is only a three-point spread. And I mean only a three-point spread. Ray, we could look back on this game, and I could see the Packers winning by nine points. That's how I'm excited for with this Packers passing attack, attacking the, to use this word again, weakness of where the Rams defense is at the moment. And again, more information coming out. A player that we talked about yesterday with the wide receivers, make sure you check that video out. But Romeo Dobbs potentially may not play in this matchup as well. Um, mm. Dontavian Wicks and Jaden Reed, Josh Jacobs, this LA Rams defense, not only do they allow opposing running backs to have good weeks and opposing wide receivers to have good weeks, they love to let quarterback score points. Fifth most points against this defense goes to the quarterback position. We are all in on Jordan Love this week. I believe that he will be able to do a lot of damage down the field to both Dontavian Wicks. If Romeo Dobbs is out there, Jaden Reed is going to get his. This is just a juicy matchup. I believe the total in this one is 46, 46 and a half points right now, according to Vegas. We could look back at the end of the week and just say there was hidden juicy goodness out of this entire yep. matchup, especially when you're looking at the Rams. But Jordan Love this week, week two back, and I think one of the most encouraging things from his performance back from the injury was I believe on 55 dropbacks, he was only sacked one time, once or twice on 55 dropbacks. Yeah. I like that. That means he got out of that game healthy, ready to go here in week five. And this is one of those offenses that even if they start slow or he makes some turnovers in the first half and maybe they're down by seven points or 10 points, you know, in the second half, there's always a chance that they throw for three touchdowns because it's just how it's orchestrated and how it's conducted. And then how Jordan Love plays football. It's just a bunch of deep shots and then some really cool manufactured stuff underneath. Now, I just hope the Rams can keep up here and this can transition us into Matthew Stafford here in a second because the Rams have trade so, trailed so heavily in games this year. They have only faced 25.5 passing attempts per game. That's the third fewest in the league and no passer has thrown more than 30 passes in a game this season. So I still think that Jordan Love can get there in 29 passes in this game, but I also could see the Rams offense matching for a good portion of this game what the Packers do. And we could see Jordan Love hit 30, 37 pass attempts too. It isn't, aren't the Rams an interesting team? Because when, just when you think it's done, like there's no chance Cooper cup is <laughs> out, no Puka Nakua offensive line banged up Aaron Donald somehow they just find ways to score points. And you know what that's attributed to great coaching. And that's what they have with Sean McVay. So I do believe that when you have a veteran quarterback like Matthew Stafford, the complement of weapons around him does not seem good right now, but the Green Bay Packers are allowing 18.6 fantasy points per game to opposing quarterbacks as well. Matthew Stafford is a fearless thrower of the football. I trust him to make the most out of his situation of Tutu Atwell and Jordan Whittington. I, I kind of don't even like looking at him behind Deshaun Watson on the screen right now, but uh, <laughs> Matthew Stafford, not a high end play for me, but I, I do think this will be a scoring bonanza between these two teams. Stafford will get his. I always love a ranking show when you finally put the faces next to each other and yeah. you see that Deshaun Watson's quarterback 16 for you, Ray, and then Matthew Stafford's quarterback 17. We can always flip these if you want to, if, if you want to, I mean, I will add to in your corner, Matthew Stafford finishes the quarterback 13 in week one. And ever since then, it's been the quarterback 30, quarterback 21, and quarterback 33. And it's because he has to have throwing touchdowns, right? And we talk yes. every single week that Kyron Williams is the high value touch king. When they get inside the red zone, 
he is almost certainly going to get a rushing score. And even when they didn't, he got the receiving score. So if Matthew Stafford doesn't throw for two touchdowns in a contest or three touchdowns, he's going to finish around that quarterback 13, quarterback 21, or quarterback 30 mark. Yeah. Leave him there. Leave him there. <laughs> okay. Leave him there. But just the more we go, the, every day that goes by, I'm like, damn, those Browns. Josh has me just panicked on the entire <laughs> Cleveland situation. Leave Stafford there. Hopefully you can get Tutu Atwell and Jordan Whittington in the end zone. Okay, well, there's one more name in the top six quarterbacks we have not spoken about. And maybe shocking, it is Justin Fields as your quarterback five. Now, in the first three weeks of the season, this seemed like a, a distant thought, right? Because he was playing precise, don't turn the football over, let's restrain you, Justin Fields. But because this team was losing, what, like 17 to three, after the first half of last week, they had to resort to, hey, Justin Fields, you need to carry us. And then that leads to him getting two rushing scores, making take, maybe taking some sacks he shouldn't have or forcing some throws he, he shouldn't. But at the same time, he was allowed to make those plays and he made a whole bunch of them. So I just wonder, Ray, if Mike Tomlin, after watching the tape with Arthur Smith, said, why don't we let Justin Fields do this a bit more often from the start and we can have a bit more of a dynamic offense and your quarterback five ranking kind of indicates that. Yeah, and it's it's the progression. And what you want to see out of players like Justin Fields, where you know there are some limitations, I just want to see them stacking weeks and making progress every single week. And we're starting to see that. And the confidence will grow after that. And I know we're talking about the quarterback position, but this Dallas defense, they're number three in points allowed to the running back position. Against the quarterbacks, they're also bottom 10 team in the league. Eighth overall at allowing points to the quarterback position. This is a matchup in which Dallas will be without Demarcus Lawrence, and it's looking like Micah Parsons also will not be there. So from a pressure standpoint, you're relying on a rookie and Marshawn Nealon and guys that really don't get a lot of pressure. I, I do believe Justin Fields, even with a banged-up offensive line, will have time to find George Pickens. One of the things that Arthur Smith and his offense are not asking him to do is throw the ball over the middle of the field, putting right. it in danger, keeping it on the outside, he will have rushing lanes, and I think he'll have a couple of shots down the field to Pickens in this matchup. I like Fields a lot this week, over 30 fantasy points last week. I think Justin Fields is due for a big game. And let's not forget, they are two and a half point favorites here against the Dallas Cowboys. If you told me that ahead of week one, I would have thought you were ridiculous. This is also Sunday night football. Uh, that can be fun. That can be fun to get just. I mean, he had 192 yards and a touchdown and rushed for 41 yards and another two touchdowns after halftime. We haven't seen many quarterbacks achieve three touchdowns and 230 plus yards in entire games so far this year. So let's see if we can repeat that. All right. Uh, on the opposite end, you have Dak Prescott. Talk to me about this beloved, if I can say this for you, Cowboys offense, if I am allowed to say that. We haven't uh, talked through that before these shows, but he's your quarterback 13. So you're not expecting... Uh, that big of an effort against this uh, really solid Pittsburgh Steelers defense. I'm a little concerned. This is Ooh. a road game. This is a road game uh, for Dallas. No Brandon Cooks. They're trying to sell us down here in Dallas, Josh, on Ryan Flournoy uh, being the the wide receiver <laughs> too to step up and really get it done next to next to C.D. Lamb. I'm not buying that one. I think on the road, Dallas is going to struggle to run the ball against Pittsburgh, which is going to force them to have to throw the ball, which they can find success against this defense through by way of CeeDee Lamb. But on paper, again, on paper, this is a very, very difficult matchup for the quarterback position. They are allowing the second fewest points per game to opposing quarterbacks at 8.5 this season. I'm a little concerned about the offensive front for Dallas. I'm concerned yeah. about the lack of a rushing attack. This could be nasty. Even if CeeDee Lamb gets his, Josh, I'm not expecting a monster performance out of Dak Prescott in this one. Yeah, I'm with you. I really have no notes on this Cowboys offense. It, it doesn't seem to be going well other than Dak to CeeDee Lamb. And even that isn't quite hitting the heights every yep. single series, every single week, like it was in previous years. And other than Jake Ferguson, who we will be ranking highly, um, there's no other option. Like you can't rely on the running game. They don't really have a vertical outside of their player besides this. So uh, we talked about CeeDee Lamb and how he's going to be working in the slot. And that's where the Steelers are actually uh, most defective in their defense. So I'm not concerned about that. I'm just concerned about everything else, everything else here. Okay, <laughs> let's keep it moving. Your quarterback eight 
once again, since CJ Stroud is your quarterback seven, uh, is Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy's playing good football. He's facing the Arizona Cardinals. This game's at home. They're seven and a half point favorites here. I mean, Purdy leads the NFL in passing yards right now at over 1,100 yards per pass attempt at over nine. Again, tight window throws he's making despite Debo Samuel missing some time, despite Brandon Ayuk dropping touchdowns. He's also one of the best downfield throwers at this point. I mean, a fantastic stat from the great Richie Bar. He has a league high 37 completions on throws 10 or more yards downfield, 11 more than the next highest passer. He's completing 66% of those throws. The league averages at 46.6%. I know these are great names ahead of him in the top seven. This is a fantastic quarterback eight on the week. Fantastic. And ha- if not for the Cardinals being dreadful against running backs and our love for James Conner, Brock Purdy would probably be a lot higher. He's third in the NFL in EPA per drop back, pushing the ball downfield, incredibly efficient. They got Jordan Mason. No, they've got Jordan Mason. And I do believe it's going to be a very big day for Jordan Mason. Brock Purdy's going to be efficient. I mean, he doesn't need 40 pass attempts. Hell, he doesn't even need 35 pass attempts some games. He's going to have his shots. I think there's a little more room for some upside. And as you look at the the quarterbacks ranked above him, you've got the majority of them can move around. It's Fields, it's Allen, it's Jaden Daniels, it's Lamar. I don't really have anything negative to say about Purdy, except it just may be a ground game with with Connor, with with Jordan Mason. It, it just they yeah. may not need him as much in this matchup. I'm gonna add in 20 and a half completions as the higher there for Brock Purdy. Uh, he might just get 21 or 22 or yep. 23. He also might be 23 or 23 against his defense. <laughs> okay. Legit. Legit. <laughs> Let's go to Kyler Murray actually because he's right after this as your quarterback nine. This is on the opposite side against the San Francisco 49ers defense. Again, they are on the road here. Um, over the opening month, he's been the quarterback 15. Then we got that quarterback one week, I believe, against the LA Rams. Yeah. Then it's quarterback 17 and quarterback 24. Um, we've talked about it all week long, especially in Sats versus Film, because the great producer himself, Weaves, pointed out outside of the top 15 plays of every single game. Kyler Murray goes basically silent. Uh, I really hope, really hope that his connection with Marvin Harrison Jr. starts hitting in those, let's say, plays 16 through 55. And if not, then the reinsertion of Trey McBride helps in that too. Yeah, Arizona, you talked about this yesterday. It's such a weird team to really get a feel for what they want to do and how they want to operate. For all of the goodness that Marvin Harrison and Trey McBride brings, this is one of the teams that's in the bottom portion of the NFL and pass rate over expected, minus 5.5%. So you feel like they should be throwing the ball a little bit more, and it's actually not happening. It's not, it's not an insurmountable matchup against San Francisco, but it's also not, it, it's not an easy matchup either. I think yeah. Kyler's going to have his opportunities but there's a reason why he's kind of at the back end of that QB one range this week. I, I think he needs to get some rushing to his repertoire here. And he opened with it earlier on this season. And then the last, I think the last week or week two or last two weeks, he, he barely has. Um, I will add this 49ers defense has only allowed one top 12 scoring quarterback so far this season. I'm a little bit hesitant of Kyler Murray based on, on what I have seen. There are moments where it's just magical you know, and it all mm-hmm. works. And when it's in flow, then it's a fade away and I'm no look and all this type of stuff. And that can hit, I think for an entire game at some point, I just find it difficult to believe it's going to hit against San Francisco. Can I ask you this, Josh? Yeah. Why is that? I- I'm watching Daniel Jones prioritize Malik neighbors. And I would yeah, yeah, say yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I- I- you know, I-, I think Kyler's a better quarterback than Daniel Jones, but why is it not as simple as get the ball to McBride, get it to Marv? I think it's a great question. One, we didn't have Trey McBride last week, right? And so sometimes, and especially in this offense, I always talk about this. With the Cleveland Browns, so many of the primary options go to David and Joku, right? We were going to see that here with this offense. As we saw at the back half of last year, Trey McBride just goes off. And to what you're saying, they don't really have an easy button on offense other than James Conner, right? And so with the Giants, we can feed Malik Neighbors these crossing patterns, mesh, drag routes, all that type of stuff. And he can win after the catch. Marvin Harrison Jr. is just being asked to, hey, we're going to put three guys on this side, one guy over here. And if I see this one-on-one alert, I'm going to take it. And right now their timing's just off. So it's not like an easy button right now 
for this team. And some of it's a Drew Petzing problem, who I was really excited for heading into this year, but he really hasn't figured it out other than that LA Rams game, I believe, in week three or week two, I should say. Um, okay, let's keep it moving. Sam Darnold is your quarterback 10. This is, we know, in London. I think Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, if I'm not mistaken, uh, against the New York Jets. Two and a half point favorites here. And I want to say, you are considerably higher than consensus on Sam Darnold. I believe they have him as quarterback 16. And again, he's your quarterback 10. I'm buying into the I'm buying into the one year renaissance and the magic of Sam Darnold. And a lot of it is because of Kevin O'Connell, the way that they're calling plays, the aggressive nature in which Sam Darnold in this offense is playing. And I've watched the games. Yes, there were a few throws that probably should have been intercepted as well that he's 100%. thrown amongst those 11 touchdown passes. But Justin Jefferson is the great equalizer. And I went back and I've watched him this year. He looks different. He he looks Physically, he looks different, and he looks like he's playing at a different speed. This Vikings team is for real, and they're playing with confidence. Sam Darnold is playing confidently, and I can't say the same thing about the Jets. And I know on paper they've given up the least amount of points to opposing quarterbacks, but this is one where I do believe that the coaching advantage in a matchup early in the morning, way away from your normalcy and your routine – Yep. That is where the advantage is going to lie. And I give that advantage to Kevin O'Connell and I give that advantage to Brian Flores. Yeah, I love that point. And I, I do feel like those two to three to four plays or throws per game that Sam Darnold is getting away with right now at any point can come back to haunt him like it has in his past. Again, yes. it hasn't so far. Maybe it does in this game against the Jets. But the coaching advantage, I think, takes us straight into the conversation here with Aaron Rodgers as your quarterback 10 or excuse me, 20, I should say because this offense just has like no coaching to it. <laughs> like it's the offense that he brings. It's Nathaniel Hackett, which we can joke about Sean Payton's success in Denver. But I think what he has been saying about Nathaniel Hackett is very true. In fact, let's not forget that Garrett Wilson has kind of come out and said this to the media yeah. in his podcast or radio interviews or whatever saying like, Hey, I see these cool manufactured design things across the league and we're not doing any of that stuff. And speaking of coaching advantage, that's going up against Brian Flores, who blitzes, pressures you exactly what we saw with the Denver Broncos last week. And Rodgers doesn't like these like post snap movements on defense. That's why he doesn't want motion or shifts before the snap. He wants to see the picture painted for yep. him and to attack off that. So if we see Brian Flores changing the picture for him post snap, I'm not here to say that Aaron Rodgers isn't a good quarterback. I just think that this might confuse him more than other defenses might. I really don't know what else to say because you look at this team, you look at Rodgers, you look at the weapons, you look at the rushing game, and nobody's that it looks a mess. It yep. honestly, it it looks a mess. And Flores is going to move him around. He's not going to give Aaron Rodgers what he wants. He is going to move in and out, have safeties adjusting. He's already blitzing at a ridiculous clip. This is one with Rodgers. I think you're very dependent on his success revolving around Brees Hall's involvement in the receiving game. If Aaron Rodgers is going to exceed these expectations that I have on him this week, it's going to be on the back and the shoulders of Brees Hall getting him some touchdowns, some maybe some cheap, easy touchdowns. I'm not going to bank on the 8 a.m. London game being the Garrett Wilson breakout game. Not this <laughs> week for the Jets. But I, I did like your call in the wide receiver ranking show of Mike Williams because maybe it's a, hey, when in doubt and we have to get 12 yards or 14 yards in this play, why not throw it up to Big Mike who yeah. has come down with some of those balls in 50-50 situations? And look, could I be totally wrong and we look back on this game and Aaron Rodgers hits 270 yep. passing yards? Of course, man. The guy's won multiple MVPs. He's on track to go to the Hall of Fame. That can happen. But I also believe that Brian Flores is kind of licking his lips here and saying, I'm going to throw a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff at Aaron Rodgers. All right, let's keep it moving because if I can scroll back up to where you had Sam Darnold, now we have quarterback 11 and this one's up in the air. Right now you have Anthony Richardson here. Let's say Anthony Richardson doesn't play or does play. Uh, you can talk about that and then you can talk about Joe Flacco because I think we got a report from someone who was at Colts camp uh, or practice, I should say, on Friday saying that Anthony Richardson was watching Joe Flacco take many first team reps. But it also seems like Anthony Richardson has also been taking practice reps and it's probable to play. So I have no idea how to handle this one. Yeah, neither do I. I saw the same report as you, and I actually saw a clip of Averich throwing deep passes in practice. He said he didn't do much, but he was throwing passes in practice. So right now, we rank Anthony Richardson at QB 11. And I understand that there's been 
a healthy amount of panic and fear. I'm not one of those people. I am not panicked. I am not afraid. I am not fearful. A. Rich has started 10 games in his whole career of the NFL, less than that. He didn't play a lot of snaps in college. This is to be expected for a second-year player who did not play a lot last year. This matchup versus the Jags, if he's playing, hell yeah, I want Anthony Richardson. I am not fearful about this defense at all. If yeah. Flacco plays, we can have a different conversation, but I really wanted to keep it on Anthony Richardson because if he is active, I know there are a lot of people who are like, do I start Stafford over him? Would you start Andy Dalton over him? And my answer is no, Josh, it's me not. Either. Yeah, me either. And look, I'm not sure if Vegas has the information or not, but the line really hasn't changed. It opened at 22. It's now 21 and a half. 21 and a half points is still totally fine here uh, for a team on the road. And Look, I know the Jaguars defense has faced C.J. Stroud. They faced Josh Allen. They faced Tua. But they also allowed a top 12 scoring week to Deshaun freaking Watson. So I think Anthony Richardson can also have a top 12 scoring week on this team. And that brings us over to Trevor Lawrence, who for you is quarterback 15. Um, I have I actually have more concerns about the Jaguars offense than I do the Colts offense, even if everyone is focusing in on this Colts passing attack with Anthony Richardson. because. Unless Evan Ingram comes into this equation, we can talk about this in the tight end stuff too, and is able to fix kind of the easy button of this passing offense, then the series in, series out consistency element of this Jaguars team has just been non-existent so far. Both of these opposing defenses, they give up a lot of points to opposing quarterbacks. They're two in three in points allowed to the quarterback position. The Colts given up about 21.7 points per game to opposing quarterbacks. This should be a good spot for Trevor Lawrence to get the ball to Brian Thomas down the field, get the, get the ball to Christian Kirk. I, what T-Law are you going to get? It is honestly one of the more wild roller coaster rides that you can experience in fantasy football. There are throws and moments in which he looks incredible, and there are times where you're like, I can't believe they gave him $200-plus plus million Get the ball to Brian Thomas Jr., Trevor Lawrence. The rushing attack is really what I'm curious to see. I think that... Mm. That, along with Evan Ingram. Evan Ingram being out, I did not think was going to have that big of an impact on Trevor Lawrence, but it feels like that's a security blanket. And yeah. when he doesn't have him, he kind of doesn't know what to do outside of a wide-open Kirk or Brian Thomas. That's going to be interesting to monitor. I don't have a lot of confidence in T-Law, but the matchup should be one in which he should be successful in fantasy. Against cover three so far this year, he's completed 25 of 36 passes for eight and a half yards per pass attempt. Uh, if he just faced cover three all the time, he'd be a much better quarterback statistically than he has been so far. And he gets to that a lot here in this game. Something's going to give, you know, I mean, the Jaguars are averaging a league low 39 and a half offensive snaps per game. The Colts are 31st with 40 offensive snaps per game. So uh, again, something's got to give. All right, we'll keep it moving. Patrick Mahomes here at quarterback 12. I mean, this sucks. All right. But Ray, I want to spin this positively, all right? We talk yeah. about it all the time. You can go back for decades here, if it even has gone back for decades, with DFS, all right? The formula. The formula is always go with the home favorite quarterback with this team projected for 24 points. That's exactly what we're getting here with the Kansas City Chiefs projected for 24 points and actually five and a half point home favorites against the New Orleans Saints. So I ask you, if the Colt, or excuse me, if the Chiefs are going to hit 24 points. Are they really going to do it through rushing touchdowns of Kareem Hunt and Samaje P. Ryan? Or somehow, somehow, is Patrick Mahomes going to account for three of these passing touchdowns? And that's what gets us here. There, there are no data points. There's no, no way to quantify <laughs> this. We're just having a little ball talk. If I were a fly on the wall, I would assume that there was a conversation that took place between Mahomes, Andy Reid, Travis Kelsey. That said, boys, we got we to gotta step this thing up. We have got to do something a little bit different based on the situation that we're currently in. We, we saw Travis Kelsey sort of reemerge into this offense out of necessity last week. I do not believe that they're going to get 24 points on the, on the back of Kareem Hunt and Carson Steele and whomever. This may concentrate things down for Mahomes a little bit, help the offense out. New Orleans, is th this should be a difficult matchup. It should be a good game, but I think... 
adjusting our expectation level for Mahomes is probably the bigger takeaway. And I know a lot of people are going to see him at QB 12. Oh my God, you guys are panicked. You're out, Ray. I still That's pretty high for him lately. I, I got to say. Yeah. <laughs> I, I still have him as a top 12 option. Yeah. But the, the expectation level from a fantasy production standpoint has to be adjusted. And even if there are some players behind him that you're like, I would start over Mahomes, I'm not going to argue it, but we start. We got to start to adjust this. I do think that they will have a different looking offense. And I'm very curious to see what this looks like on Monday night. Yeah. I mean, these things are almost contradictory, right? 24 points expected. However, the saints defense has only allowed one touchdown pass through four weeks with six takeaways. If we're talking about slot and covering Travis Kelsey in that area, I think Elante Taylor is really good. We've seen Tyron Matthew have a bit of a resurgence so far this year. And Patrick Mahomes has only had one top 10 scoring week over his past 13 regular season games. But maybe just when everyone counts them out, and again, this is kind of what Vegas is projecting here, 24 points, uh, they're back. And he be comes back and arrives uh, into our top 12 or top 10 scores. Okay, we'll keep it moving with Geno Smith, who uh, talk about being back, sir. What a season. What a season for Geno. <laughs> He's opened the year with three top 10 scoring weeks over the first four games again if to me you want to start geno smith over patch mahomes go for it this is home favorites and they're supposed to win by six and a half points here this game is going to end one of two ways i'm going to tell you right now it's going to end one of two ways one kenneth walker absolute nuclear performance rb1 yep. on the week just three touchdowns stomp the giants or two geno smith goes crazy they put up a whole bunch of points on the giants that can't compete and it gets out of hand no Malik Neighbors, ruled out. Devin Singletary, DNP, once again. We are truly relying. Sometimes when I'm looking at these quarterback matchups, I'm also looking at the opposing team to see what type of offensive performance they're going to do. Are we going to be put in a situation like last week where Geno Smith was forced to air it out? I yep. just don't think it's going to be necessarily needed from Seattle in this matchup. If I had to guess today, I would say I think Geno Smith – uh, and Kenneth Walker both start out hot. Maybe the passing attack cools off in the second half, and it's Kenneth Walker, Zach Charbonnet. But I am still very much in on a player who's been balling at the start of the season. Geno Smith has been outstanding. I, I like your point. In mid-sentence for you, I took this lower on 34 passing attempts, not because I don't think Geno can win the game by himself. He just probably doesn't need to. And that's quite no. different. I mean, he already has the second most dropbacks in the NFL so far. And again, just looking at last week, he had 56 of them. We can also look at that Miami Dolphins game when he had 34 attempts, like 34 dropbacks, right? So I, I want to take the lower here just to what you're saying, especially with Malik Neighbors missing on the opposite side. Yeah. I just don't know how Gino is going to be even needed for 34 no. passing attempts in this game. Okay. Uh, do we even need to talk about <laughs> Daniel Jones? Uh, he's he's way down the list. I mean, like way down the list. So no, we'll just throw him no. there. I don't know if you want to say anything about that offense. No. We kind of already talked about Wondell Robinson yesterday. No, not really. No, I, I would okay. not. I would not feel <laughs> confident start, starting Daniel Jones this week. Now, well, let's go to your quarterback eighteen. Then that is Caleb Williams. This is against the Carolina Panthers. They're at home. They are four point favorites here. Last week, Caleb Williams completed a season high seventy four percent of his passes. That only equaled one hundred fifty seven yards and one score. I told you that I went back and watched that game and I didn't even like it. It wasn't fun. It wasn't exciting. It wasn't creative. It wasn't cool. But I can say that the Carolina Panthers defense is pretty brutal, pretty bad. They like pass rushers. And so if there was a get right spot for this offense to click and gel and maybe have some optimism moving forward, to me, it would be here at home against the Panthers. Yeah. And, and what I'm can, can see, curious about seeing is, are the Bears just pulling back on Caleb Williams a little bit to ask him mm. not to do as much USC stuff? They lean on DeAndre Swift in the ground game in which you can exploit Carolina. I don't know what Shane, I, I, this, this identity in Chicago, Josh, what do they want to be? Spread and shred? They want to go, they want to go run and shoot or do they want to pound the They want to be too well, many things, man. You're, you're hitting the nail on the head. Like we, we get these weird triangle formations, diamond formations, or like circles around Caleb Williams. We get multiple tight end sets. Guys, all you need to do, and it was, has been some of his best stuff so far this year, is deep play action, under center, give him some extra protection, hit his back foot, and let it rip. Go back to go. the basics here a little bit, Shane Waldron. Yeah, and, and because of that, you, you got I'm, I've got Caleb Williams in a range where there's some upward mobility, QB 18, yeah. but I just don't have the confidence 
in the off. A lot of times when we have these takes, there's nothing to do with the player. I'm not anti Caleb. I don't think Caleb, I have no confidence in the identity and the direction of that offensive environment right now. But DJ Moore, Romo Dunze, yes. Ian Allen, DeAndre Swift, at any point, could it click? And could it click against arguably a bottom two defense in the league? 100%. So I, I, I totally, totally get this ranking. If it doesn't hit here, then man, we have even more questions. Like Shane Waldron's already on watch. Uh, that seat could be on fire, let's say, after after five weeks of the season. I'm just going to throw up the rest of the names because yeah. hopefully by this point of, I don't know, 20 players already on the board, 18 players you already have on the board, um, your quarterback is already starting here. We have Andy Dalton as quarterback 19. Then like we said, Aaron Rodgers as quarterback 20. Then it is Derek Carr followed by Bo Nix. Uh, then we get Daniel Jones as quarterback 23. Then Snoop Huntley as quarterback mm -hmm. 24. And we'll just close this thing out with uh, Gardner Minshew. And hey, maybe we get a little bit of Drake May this week. Who knows? Anything you want to talk about with like Carr or Dalton or Bo Nix or Snoop or any of these guys? I like Andy Dalton. I, I like Andy okay. Dalton on the week. I was in on Andy Dalton last week. If I were forced to start, I'll just say this. Um, I mean, I have him above Aaron Rodgers. I would start Andy Dalton over Rodgers. Uh, if you don't like Deshaun Watson, I honestly think the more I just keep looking at Watson in that yellow row, it just bothers the hell out of me, Josh. Uh, but other than that, other than Andy Dalton, I would not feel comfortable playing Carr versus Kansas City. I'm not going to talk about Snoop Huntley. Maybe Minshew can garbage time his way to some points. I do think there's a chance we see young rookie Drake May in this matchup. Brissett has been pretty bad. Here's my big take, all right? Bo Nix against the Jets was miserable. Negative seven passing yards at halftime. I think weather played a major factor in that. Weather will not be a factor against the Las Vegas Raiders, hopefully. Uh, we have seen Bo Nix back in week three. I thought actually looked competent, his best game by far. But every single game this season, We've had rushing yards be a part of this, except this past week. I mean, 47, 20, he's fantastic at escaping sacks. Uh, I'm going to take this higher on 20 and a half rushing yards, and that brings us three players that we're taking the rushing yards higher on. Again, you can tail this. You can click on it at the top of the comments down below. All right, let's just go through these tight ends, right? We're going to throw them all on the board because they're basically all the same outside the first few. <laughs> Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, Jake Ferguson, Don Kincaid, Brock Bowers, and Trey McBride make up your top six. Any thoughts of wisdom here on any of those six names, Ray? Kincaid may be fed. No Khalil Shakir versus mm. Houston. We're talking about some scoring. Love me some Kincaid this week. We're going to get vintage Travis Kelsey in this matchup with Nova Shee Rice, Kareem Hunt, George Kittle. I, I think there was a little bit of news about him not being 100% in practice or whatnot, but I think he's going to be just fine in this matchup. And you said it in the Pittsburgh Steelers section. I really like Jake Ferguson this week. Yeah. Very high on Jake Ferguson. With no Brandon Cooks, I'm not buying Ryan Flournoy right now. Uh, give me some Jake Ferguson versus Pittsburgh in that matchup. And I think Patrick Queen, after getting a pretty decent contract, I mean, I used to say a whole bunch of money in free agency, has not been great for this either so far. And so Jake Ferguson could kind of feast over the middle of the field a little bit. Um, I'm used to see Brock Bowers. I don't know if Michael Mayer is playing this week or not, but Bowers is kind of, forced to block a bit more often this past week because of the pass rushing situation. We know this Broncos defense blitzes a whole bunch. And so if they're blitzing and sending extra people, Brock Bowers might have to be forced to ke keep in and, and stay in pass protect and chip and release rather than the awesome routes he was running against the Ravens. So to me, that might knock his production just a little bit. Okay, this next year. My favorite pickup of the week, Tucker Craft. I mean, he was kind of acting as the check and release guy and rumble for 15 yard gains. We talked about Evan Ingram. Then there's Pat Fryermuth, Zach Ertz, Kobe Parkinson, and all the way down at tight end 12, it's Mark Andrews. And I even threw in names like Hunter Henry, David yeah. Njoku, and Tyler Conklin. Right. I think if David Njoku does play, I think he should be in everyone's lineup because he is going to be a important piece of that Browns offense to get back on track in the best matchup. Like we talked about that they could have all season long. Yeah, I am. Uh, if they say he's active, I'm not overthinking yep. it. Plug him in. Don't, uh, he's not going to get in. plug him into your lineup. Uh, Evan Ingram is another one to monitor Tucker craft weekly lock and loaded starter. We've talked about this damn game at nauseum for out the entire week. We're firing up Packers versus this Rams defense. Andrews is the one I know a lot of people are going to ask about. 
I just I cannot trust it at this point in time. Uh, the route yep. participation, the matchup versus the Bengals. I can't trust he or Isaiah Likely in this matchup. If they're going to run the ball and be bullies, it's going to be a lot of Patrick Ricard and it's going to be a lot of Charlie Kolar. And that equals less snaps, less routes, less meaningful pass, like pure pass down plays for Mark Andrews and Isaiah Likely. And then just fantasy points suffer from that, right? They're just multiple. They can beat you in multiple ways. So I'm with you on all of this. All right. This has been great. Ray, you're the man. I hope you enjoy your uh, family vacation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's my son's uh, fifth birthday. So going to Disney oh, wow. World to surprise him. So oh, it, wow. Well, I, won't, I won't ruin his surprise. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Yeah, of course, man. Uh, you'll be back here, not this upcoming week, but the week after that. And I'm sure everyone in the comments down below will be eagerly anticipating that. Once again, you support us. That means you should go and support Underdog at the exact same time. It's Boostober. Go and play. We give you free stuff all month long, literally every single day. Promo code the show. Click the link in the description down below or just click this pickle entry that's at the top of the comments. Shout out to Weaves. Shout out to Ray. And I will see you probably around 1130 Eastern on Sunday morning for the Start Sit Show. Talk to you all then.